me just make sure it's recording. This time. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> so welcome to um, Probability and Statistics, Math 3081. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Chapter 2.2 today. We're going to start right in. But first, I just want to clarify some things that are on our syllabus. So this is a syllabus that's up on our um, Blackboard page. Um, the things that you want to take a note at, make sure that you know my email address is right here. Okay, so you guys can send me email anytime you have any questions um, about what you need to do or how things are going to be done. Um, right now, for this week in particular, we're going to take a test drive and see how it goes. Um, we have our class time. Okay, our class time is going to be from 10 o'clock until 1140 a.m. This is Eastern Standard Time. I am going to record these uh, lectures so that you can um, then download the lectures and take a look at them later. This will help for people who are in um, different time zones. Um, also, we've got live Q&A, which is like our, also our office hours, and that's going to happen um, Monday through Thursday, 12.30 to 1.15. If we need more time on that, like if we're right before a test or something, we can go a little bit later on that as well. Okay, so just some things to take into account. Um, on our syllabus, it also tells us, but on our syllabus, we've got three in-class tests that we're going to have. And as we get closer to the tests and the quizzes, I'll explain how all that's going to work on the Blackboard page and how you need to do this because we're all doing this remotely. Um, the, the tests themselves are going to be on whatever material is chunked between each individual test. And it's only the final exam that's going to be cumulative for the whole semester, okay? Um, the final exam itself is 30% of the grade the math department um, has given us permission to reduce the amount that the final exam is worth. Normally, um, math final exams are about 40%, but because we're going online this semester, we've reduced it to 30. Um, so we've got three uh, midterm exams that are 40% total, okay? Um, we have quizzes, uh, quizzes are 25%. Um, we have four quizzes total, and we can revisit this, um, how this goes, but we have four quizzes total, and the lowest quiz grade will be dropped, okay? Um, we also have homework. Okay, the homework should be posted already on our assignment page, on our Blackboard page for this week. Homeworks are due on Thursday. I'm collecting them. I think I said it to be due um, at midnight on Thursday, so you guys have some leeway. You can come to office hours on Thursday in the afternoon and ask me questions about that as well. Um, <clears throat> the homeworks, um, we'll talk about also how we're going to be uploading all of these things um, uh, into Blackboard so that I can actually grade them. Um, the homeworks are worth 5% of your grade. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be checking for completion on your homework. So I'm going to look through each of your homework pages, okay? And I'm going to be checking to see, did you make a reasonable effort on the homework problems, okay? So I can tell, like, when I'm looking at garbage. So don't just write a bunch of numbers down. Make a reasonable effort for how things are going. If you, like, skipped half of the homework problems that, that were due, you'll get a 5 out of 10. So only 50% of the credit. Now, what will happen is um, the next week, right, every Thursday I'll collect the homework, you can pass in your old homework that you got a five out of 10 on and get points back for that, okay? So just because you got a five out of 10 this week doesn't mean you can't go back and finish those problems. Just send me an email to let me know that you have resubmitted it so I know to go take a look for it. Um, normally in a regular class, in an in-person class, I would collect your papers and so then I would have them, I'd be able to work it that way. Um, so just let me know that you resubmitted it so I can um, then give you credit for those points that are off. Um, let's see, I just want to call your attention to um, some other things. By the way, um, I put down here, based on what the registrar said about the pass-fail times, um, for you to be able to specify whether it's pass-fail. Um, I just heard, I don't know if this is true, um, that we're, we may be actually going for a grade, that pass-fail might not be an option in the summer. I'm not sure, so please check with your advisor and find out. Um, and I'm also checking with the math department and trying to find that out too. So I'll let you know as soon as I know. So keep in mind that we may not be able to do pass fail this um, semester. Um, <clears throat> the schedule, it's a really quick schedule. This is the second page of our syllabus. It's a really quick schedule, right? We've got basically seven weeks of content that we're looking at. And so the class itself, normally, even in a regular semester, the class goes fast because there's so much material to cover. But because we're in a summer class, it, it seems like it's going to go even quicker, okay? So keep that in mind when you're working on it, that essentially we're looking at, um, you know, every two sections on here, every two, cl um, two classes that we have in a summer session is equivalent to like one week in a regular semester class. So if you miss a couple sections, or if you miss a couple classes, or if you've fallen behind on that material, you may actually be falling farther behind, like if we were in a real, like a, a full-time, you know, like a fall or a spring semester. So the class goes fast summer goes even faster. So make sure you stay up um, on how things are going. 
Um, we have homework. I would advise every day after class, just take a look at the homework, okay, for that particular chapter section so that you start to kind of um, get a move on what the topics are and you don't forget things, okay? Um, <clears throat> also make sure I'm going to be working through our lecture, let's see if I can, this should be coming up, our lecture examples, right? This is um, chapter 2.2, our lecture examples. So I typed up all the different types of um, examples that we have for each section, okay, um, that we're doing. And it will save time so I don't have to actually write out all the questions every time. And it will give you a place, a piece of paper for you to actually write all the example questions on too. Um, so make sure before each lecture that you print out um, the lecture examples. Maybe you want to print it out for the whole week too in case we move ahead into a different um, chapter section. We cover multiple chapter sections in one day. Um, print them out and then that way as we're working through the class you can write down what the solutions are. Um, I'll also be scanning in the solutions as, after I write them. I'll be scanning them in and then posting them at the end of the day so you can always go back and reference them. But um, keep this in mind, you'll want to have this page um, as we're working through the uh, chapter. <clears throat> okay, so with that said, I'm going to start right in on chapter 2.2. Chapter 2.2 has a lot of um, definitions in it. So chapter 2.2, it's called sample spaces and sets. Okay. And the thing about chapter 2.2, it does, like I said, have a lot of vocabulary, but we need this vocabulary so that when we talk about things like events or sample spaces or things, you know what it is exactly that we're talking about. Okay, so we're gonna start off with that. So some definitions that we're gonna work with. The first one, it seems pretty basic, but we're going to define what is an experiment exactly. Okay, so an experiment itself is any procedure that can be repeated an infinite number of times. So it's repeatable. That's the important thing about our um, experiment is that it's repeatable. And we also want to specify too, it has a fairly well-defined <clears throat> set of possible outcomes. So normally we go into an experiment with a hypothesis, right? We set up a set of procedures that we're gonna do in order to test that hypothesis. We have a rough idea of what we think we're gonna get for results, okay? And those are the possible outcomes that we're looking at. Okay, so our experiment is basically any procedure that allows us to repeat the set, okay? And it, the possible outcomes are fairly well-defined, okay? So this type of a thing, um, let's see if I can move this up onto the side here. Um, I'm not sure where this is going to show up in the video, but let me at least get it out of the way so that we're not seeing it. Okay. okay, so some examples are we can think about we do rolling of a pair of dice. We're going to be rolling a lot of dice in the class this semester in terms of our examples, but we can also um, measure someone's or a bunch of people, their blood pressure. We can also measure hearing level. And we can test, is somebody deaf? Do they have a hearing loss? Those type of things, okay? So some things that are not experiments are like, I'm gonna go to a psychic and I'm gonna have them draw a picture of what I'm thinking, okay? That's not repeatable, right? And it doesn't have a well-defined set of outcomes, okay? So experiment. Another um, definition. Let's call this sample outcome. Okay, and I'm going to write this as a lowercase s. Let me write that. Okay, sample outcome, basically this is each of the potential outcomes of a given experiment. Okay, these are all the possibilities that we can have, right? These are each of these each of the sample outcomes is a possible outcome of an experiment that we're doing. Our sample space okay, is a place where we're going to take all of our sample outcomes and we're going to group them together. This is we call uppercase S. Okay, and this is <clears throat> our total number 
and kind of possible outcomes. Okay, that gives us our sample space. So our lowercase s is an element of our uppercase s, right? Each individual outcome is a part of our overall sample space. That makes sense. This is just as an example, let's write out, this isn't on our examples page, but our possible experiment that we could do. And then the possible sample space that we're looking at. Okay, so possible experiment is I'm gonna toss one coin. I flip a coin, heads or tails, right? That's my sample space. I have a head or I get a tail. Okay, I'm flipping a quarter, say for example. We're gonna roll a die. We're going to assume in this class that the dice that we're rolling are six-sided die unless we tell you otherwise. Okay, so this is our possible sample spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, all the possible different faces on that die. So, oops, sorry, you can't see that. Um, the other type of experiment that we could do is where we could toss two coins, right? So if I toss two coins, I could get different kinds of combinations. We're going to be talking this semester about how we look at that. So I could get a head and a head, get a head and a tail, I can get a tail and a tail, and I can get a tail and a head. So you notice I'm not worrying about the order per se, I'm just talking about what are my possible sample spaces. These are just examples to kind of think about. <clears throat> okay, so let's also declare a definition. something called an event. Event is really important. Okay, it's something that we're going to be talking about a lot um, in this semester. So an event is a designated collection of simple outcomes Let me write it down on the top. Simple space. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm doing some experiment. I have a possible, I have the whole sample space, right? I've got like, I'm going to roll a die. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. An event is something that I'm going to define. I want to just look at an event A. I only get odd numbers when I roll a die, you know, odd number faces that come up. So I'm going to define the event specifically, and I'm going to be looking for those, okay? But the events also can include everything that could possibly happen or nothing at all. Nothing at all means nothing happened. That's our null set. Okay, so as an example, we'll go to my um, example space here. Let me just check to make sure, because it didn't record before. Good, it's still recording. Okay, <clears throat> so right here on our um, lecture examples page, right, we're doing example number one. So we're going to flip a coin three times, okay? We want to know what's the sample space, and we want to know what sample outcomes make up the event that we're defining, event A, which is the majority of coins show heads, okay? So this is a fairly finite um, set of samples, so I'm going to be able to enumerate them all. As we go along, we're going to talk about algorithms for, um, yeah, I don't have to define or enumerate everything. Okay, So the first time, we're going to go first toss. On the first toss, I can get ahead. Okay, On the second toss, on the second toss, I can either get ahead or I can get a tail. Okay. On the third toss, Right, I can get a head or a tail, or I can get a head or a tail. Okay, that's all assuming I got a head on the first toss. So now I'm going to do the other part, which is I got a tail on the first toss. Okay, on the second toss, I can get a head or a tail, and on the third toss, I can get a head or a tail or a head or a tail. Okay, so all of these here, right. These are our final set from our third toss. These are our final set from our second toss. These are our final from our, our first toss. So in order to set up our total sample space, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the path, right? I'm going to go, I'm going to follow this path here. So I'm going to go head, 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 tail, head, tail, head, head, tail, tail. Okay, now this path, tail, head, head, tail, head, tail. 
I'm going to go tail, tail, head, tail, tail, tail. Okay, so that's our total sample space, right? I just followed each path, right? And I recorded what the different possibility was. And that gives us all the possibilities within our sample space. Now, A says we want, right, out of this whole total sample space, we want the one that has the majority of heads, okay? So that means I'm going to look here. I've got three heads in here. So that goes into event A. I've got two heads and one tail, two heads and one tail, two tails. That one doesn't count. This one here, I've got two heads. That one counts. This is two tails. That's two tails. That's three tails. So we're done. So I have four possibilities that satisfy event A out of a total sample space of eight. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, example two. Oops, right here. Okay. I'm trying to get this all on the screen here centered. All right, so example two says we're going to find the sample space for rolling two dice. Okay. Event A is the sum of the faces equals seven, and event B is that the um, face numbers are the same. Okay, so when we do this, I'm going to set up a table, right? So, like I said, these are six sided die unless you um, care otherwise. So, for the first one, Right, my options for the first die are one, two, three, four, five, six. And my options for the second die, right, for rolling, I can roll a one, two, three, four, five, and a six. So I'm going to fill out this table here. So let's do that. <clears throat> I come to work. going to fill in this table. So on die one, I get a one. And on die two, I get a one. On die one, I get a one. On die two, I get a two. I get a one and a three. A one and a four. A one and a five. And a one and a six. Okay, so I roll a one on die one, and I roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six on die two. We'll do the second row. So I roll a two on die one, and a one on die two. And I'm just going to keep filling out Okay, and the same thing here, I can roll a three or a one. Okay, and then our fourth column, our fourth, uh, fourth row, I can roll a four and die one, a one, a four and a two, and three. I want to write this all out um, so you can see it, and then in the future we may truncate it. And then a six. Now it's arbitrary, right? I chose die one to go in what we would have thought of as our X position and die two to go in what we thought of as our Y position, or our first and our second. It's arbitrary. I could have just as easily made the table with die two here and die one there. So I just set it up this way. I could just see so you have that idea. So this is our total sample space. Okay, I have two dies, right? I have six possibilities on the first die and six possibilities on the second die, okay? Which is gonna give me 36 possible outcomes in my sample space here, okay, given this. So now let's talk about event A. So event A was that the sum of the faces on our die sums up to seven, okay? So that means I have to look. So one plus one is equal to two. One plus two, three, four, I've got um, one plus six, right? Same thing down here. The only one that's gonna work is six comma one. 
here, I'm going to work my way through. Oh, this one, five and two, <clears throat> four and three, three and four. Now, in this case, these positions matter. This is different because this says die one and this says die two. This one says die one and this one says die two. So they actually count as separate. Okay, here now I've got um, this one right here. And then here I have one and six. Okay, so my event A, where the sum of the faces sum up to be equal to seven. Okay, right, those are my sample space. That satisfies event A. Okay, event B says the face numbers are all the same, but essentially we're looking at our diagonal here. Right, so let's enumerate that out. Okay, now I have, so we can see that. Um, I can move this one farther down here. The corner, there, okay. So now we have all of the possible outcomes for event B, okay, and all the possible outcomes for event A, and our complete sample space. Okay, for this particular um, rolling two dice. Okay, so that was example number two. <clears throat> Sorry, let's flip the page. Example number three says we're going to draw cards and we're going to find the sample space for drawing one card from an ordinary deck of cards. Okay, so let's just talk about what our sample space is. And that'll help us define what a deck of cards is made up of. Okay, so we have parts, okay, which means in the given suit of parts, I'm going to have the type of cards. I've got an ace, I've got a two, and a three, and a four, so on and so forth. I'm going to go all the way up to nine, a ten, a jack, queen, and king. Okay, there are going to be 13 cards within this suit this two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to king. This is going to repeat again for diamonds. So I'm going to go ace to all the way up to the king. There's 13 in that suit as well. <clears throat> I have spades. The ace to all the way up to king. There's 13 cards in that suit. And then we also have clubs. And there are 13 cards in that suit as well. Okay, so I've got 13 plus 13 plus 13 plus 13. I'm going to sum all these up. So I've got 13 cards in each suit. I've got four suits. This is going to give me 52 possible outcomes. Okay, this is our sample space. I didn't actually enumerate out all of the possible cards. I did a dot 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 to save us time. Okay. But basically, this is our sample space. And we're going to take one card out of all of these collection of 52. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So now, um, back also with some more words, too. When we think about events, right, we want to think about whether an event is a simple versus a compound event. So what's called a simple event Okay, this one, an event that has one outcome. See if my darker pen will work better now. Okay, but one outcome means I'm going to roll one die, right? And I'm going to look for the event that the face of the die is equal to six. That's our one outcome. Okay, that's a simple event. There's only one thing happening. If we have what's called a compound, Compound event, okay? This is an event that's made up of multiple criteria. Okay, we've got multiple events that are happening here. So this is kind of like saying, you know, I want have a deck of cards and I want to find a two of hearts, right? I want to find a number card and I want to find a heart card or I want to find an ace of spades. Okay, so these are things that I'm looking for that I um, have two different criteria that I need to solve. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, example number four on our example sheet. Okay, we want to talk about um, 
what is the sample space and also for um, for event A. So the company has two job openings and they have three women who are applying and two men who are applying. Okay, so I'm going to write this out like let me get this camera in the right spot. Bear with me here. All right, so the three women, we'll call them W1, W2, W3. Okay. And then we have three men who are applying. We'll call them, I'm sorry, not three men. We have only two men. Two men who are applying. We have man one and man two. Okay. So um, I'm going to use these to help me enumerate all the possible outcomes. Okay. When I go to do this, I'm going to think about setting it up like this W1, W2, W3, W1. W2, W3. Okay, so now my possible outcomes are like this. Uh, woman one and woman two get hired. Woman one and woman three get hired. You can see why woman one and woman one wouldn't uh, make sense. Okay, we can do women two, women one. Do women two, women three. We can do, um, sorry. Women three, women one. You can do women three, women two. Okay. So that gives me those possible outcomes there. So let's see if I can open this up. Trying to get this in focus right in a second. Okay, now the next one is where I could have woman one, woman two, woman three, and I have man one, man two. So we're going to talk about combinations for that one too. Okay, so I can go woman one to man one. I can go woman one to man two. I can go woman two to man one. Woman two to man two. Woman three to man one. Woman three to man two. But since we don't know um, about these positions, they, we're going to enumerate all possibilities, which means that the positions may be unique. So that means I did woman one to man one, but I could also do man one to woman one. Right? I could do man one to woman two. I could do man two to woman one. I could do man two to woman two. I could do man two to woman three. Okay, so we're going to be able to get um, all possible outcomes here. Okay, so we went this way, right? <clears throat> and then we also went this way. So man one, woman two. Oops, sorry, that was a mistake. There should be three here. And then here, man two, let me make sure, man one, woman one, two, three. Oops, looks like I messed up. Two, and man one, woman three, man two, woman one, man two, woman two, and man two, woman three. And my pen is fine again. Okay, good. And now we have to do the man to man. Okay, so in this case, right, I've got man one, man two, and I've got and two, and one. So these are our all possible combinations for how things can be hired. Now, this is, right, if the positions um, are equivalent, right, then I have to kind of think about, like, this is the case, the all possible outcomes are, if the positions are unique. So woman one gets hired into position one, woman two gets hired into position two. It's unique, which means that woman two, woman one, is a different combination than woman one, woman two, because the positions were unique. If the positions are not unique, Then I can get rid of the repeats. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of the repeats. So it's something like woman one, woman two is gonna be the same as woman two, woman one. So I can get rid of that, right? Which reduces this down to 10 possible. <coughs> I'll call 
columns, whereas here we have 20. Okay, we weren't told specifically, you know, are the positions unique or not, so we just kind of had to answer both questions there. Okay, so that's what we're looking at for um, example number four. Okay. All right. Sorry. So another question is, what happens, right, if we can't really enumerate all of our possibilities, okay? So if the possible outcomes um, is essentially infinite, how are we going to work with that? So what's the sample space, for example, on example number five, what's the sample space when a coin is tossed, you just keep tossing it until the first tail appears. Okay, so what that can look like is this. I've got, I have a tail appearing on the first toss. So I get a tail right away, which means I'm done, right? If I get a tail appearing on the second toss, that means I had a head on the first toss and a tail on the second toss. If I get a tail appearing on the third toss, I'm gonna get a head on the first, a head on the second, and a tail on the third. You can see where this is going, right? So our fourth toss, I'm gonna get head, a head, and a head, and then a tail, and so on and so forth. This thing is going to be what we call countably infinite, okay? So what happens is I need to have some kind of algorithm that's going to help me describe how to solve this problem. As we go along in the course, we're actually going to talk about how we can come up with the algorithms to describe this, okay? But just note, for example, for right now, what I can do is I can specify this as just a list with a dot, 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 okay? Until we start learning about how we create those algorithms. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's talk about um, some more types of definitions. So one of the things that we want to be able to define are things called unions, intersections, and complements. Okay. We're going to go through each one of these and we're going to talk about notation for them and what they actually mean to just the first one we'll talk about um is an intersection i wrote it in this order but we're going to do intersections first we write this as a intersection b this is like an upside down u okay a intersect g and what this means is event a and event b possibly they overlap maybe they don't okay but they're all within the same sample space what I'm looking at when I talk about the intersection is what outcomes are going to be common to both events. Okay, so which outcomes are common to both? Okay, so <clears throat> that leads us to example number six. I'm back here in my um, example page here. So in example six, we say, <laughs> a single card is selected from a deck of cards. Remember how we talked about them before. Event A is a set of aces. I've got an ace of hearts, ace of diamonds, ace of spades, and an ace of clubs. Event B, right, are the set of hearts. So I've got an ace of hearts, a two of hearts, a three of hearts, so on and so forth, all the way up to a king of hearts. Okay. So what we want to know is what is A intersection with B. Okay. So when we do this, right, I write A intersection B, and I'm going to think about where these two overlap each other, what they have in common. Okay, in this case, I can kind of see it in the list that I've made, right? I have ace, all the aces, which include ace of hearts, diamonds, spades, whatever, and then I've got B, which is all the suit of hearts. So the only thing that these two have, two sets have in common is our ace of hearts. Okay, the ace comes from our event A, and our hearts comes from our event B. Okay. So that's our intersection of these two events that are happening. <clears throat> okay, so a union, our next set of definitions. You may have heard these um, in different classes too. So our union, we're going to write A, union B, like this. Okay, And what this means is um, we have all the outcomes that are belong to both. Okay either A or B or both, but we're not going to have repeats in it.
All right, then no repeats. We're just gonna, this both part, we're just gonna include it only once. Okay, so <clears throat> this leads us to example seven. So example seven says, um, given a deck of cards, we're going to draw a card. A is our ace, B is our hearts. Okay, so what is the union? Okay, A union of B. Okay, so basically what happens is, right, when I go to do A union B, okay, let's think about it. Okay, so I'm going to enumerate out some of what I have here. So I've got a two of hearts, a three of hearts, four of hearts, so on and so forth, up to the king of hearts. I'm just writing it out like this just to save time. Okay, that's for my part B. My A set says, I also have the ace of hearts. I've got the ace of clubs, ace of diamonds, and then the ace of spades. Okay, so aces is our event A. Two of hearts, three of hearts, four of hearts, blah, 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 all the way up to the king of hearts is our event B. But you'll notice I have, right, my ace of hearts is counted only once, even though, right, it's basically, it's a part of both A and B, but I'm only going to count it once, okay? So that's my union of A union and B. Okay, so these were kind of logic, right? We're going to talk about an example that's uh, like a, um, maybe more mathematical, okay? So... <clears throat> I've got A, my event A, which is, I've got my whole sample space is all real numbers, right? And A says, I only want all those real numbers that are going to satisfy this parabola, x squared plus 2x minus 8 equals 0, okay? And B, right, all of my x values that are going to, you know, satisfy this value here, okay? So I want to be able to find A intersect B and A union B. That's what we're asked to do here. So first off, what I need to do is I'm going to take out A, I'm going to factor A, so I can find out what are the solutions that are going to be common to both and then not, um, not in both, or the union in both. So A, so the first thing I do is I'll write it down, x squared plus 2x minus 8 equals 0, and I'm going to factor it. x plus 4 times x minus 2 equals 0. And I don't care how you factor it, you can use quadratic formula, you can use guess and check, all of those are totally fine. Just do a quick check. If you do the guess and check, make sure you get back to the original quadratic. So there's nothing like doing all the math right, only to get the factoring wrong. Okay, so this, I said each equal to zero and I solve, so I get x equals minus four and x equals positive two. So I'm gonna write a is equal to minus four, positive two. Now we could be really specific and write a is x such that x is equal to minus four comma two, but we're just gonna write it like this. We'll do the same thing for b x squared plus x minus 6 equals 0. We're going to factor that as well. x plus 3, x minus 2 equals 0, which means x is going to equal minus 3 and positive 2. So my b is defined as minus 3, positive 2. Okay, so now we have these um, solutions to our quadratic. So we're going to start um, answering our questions here. So the first one is our intersection, a intersect b. So the intersection says what's common between both a and b? So A is minus 4, 2. B is minus 3, 2. So what's common is the 2. That's the intersection. That's what the two events, the two um, events have in common. Okay, our A union B. Okay, either A and B or both, but no repeats. Okay, so A is going to be minus 4, 2. And B is going to be minus 3, 2. Oh, 2 is already there. I don't need to double count it, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. So intersection, what's in common, A and uh, union is, right, either A or B or both, but no repeats. <clears throat> okay, our next idea that we want to be able to define is something called a complement. This is with an E, okay, complement, as opposed to complement with an I, which is saying something nice to somebody. So complement, okay, with an E, Basically, it's the set of outcomes in the sample space that are not included in the outcomes, oops, in the outcomes of your defined event. You usually think of, I've got a sample space, I've got an event A, 
And I usually say, what's A complement? It means something that's not a part of my simple space of A. That's defined by my A. Okay, so we're going to write it as, um, so if I have something like event A, okay, I would write the complement as A with a little C attached to it. Okay, you should also know that some books also write it as A with a bar over the top. Um, I don't think our book is using that bar notation. We might get it confused with vectors. So we're using A with a superscript of a C. Okay. So let's go to example number nine. Okay. <clears throat> On our example sheet. So here, right, we have a month, right, or our event, right? We've got all the months in the year, and we want to be able to define an event that says, we have a month that has 30 days. So let's just write down month that has 30 days. So I've got um, April, June, September, and November. Okay, so that's my event of months that only have 30 days. The complement of that are months that don't have 30 days. That means that we could have a month that has 28 days, 29 days, or 31 days, okay? Which means I'm left with all the other months of the year, okay? Which means I'm left with January, February, March, May, July, August, October, oops, and then December. So rolling two dices and getting a number whose sum is equal to seven. We did that actually earlier, right? <clears throat> That's the event that we're defining, okay? And our complement to this event is we're gonna roll two dice and we're gonna get a number whose sum is not seven, which is gonna leave two, three, four, five, six, not seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 or 12. Like these are the only possibles. I can only go up to 12 anyway when I have two die, two six-sided die. So this includes everything but seven. Okay. The last one, selecting a letter of the alphabet that's a vowel, right? But we're not going to include Y. And then this one here is our complement is selecting a letter that is not a vowel. I hesitate to say we're going to select a letter that's a consonant because we have um, vowels that are kind of categorized in funny, uh, letters that are categorized in funny ways. So I'll just say that it's not a vowel, okay? <clears throat> nope, sorry, in our last example, okay, um, for this particular idea is, we've got a set of XY pairs, let me get this in the view screen here. We have a set of XY pairs for which the equation X squared plus Y squared is less than one is gonna be true. We wanna know what's the complement. So the first thing I do is I'm gonna plot this out. So if I say x squared plus y squared equals zero, I'm talking about the equation for a circle with a radius equal to one, okay, and it's centered at zero. But because we're saying it's less than, right, I can't include that circumference line, okay? And I'll, I'll just call this A, which is like inside of that little block right there, a little circle, sorry. When we talk about A complement, Okay, that's everything outside of this, which let's see if I can shade it in. You can see it. This is going to go on forever. We would say it's all real numbers except for this region here. Okay, so I would actually be able to define a complement as being x squared plus y squared is greater than or equal to one. This complementary region actually also includes our circumference. It's hard to draw that on the graph here. Okay, but it's this shaded region right here. Okay. And it's defined by this equation. It's the equation that used, we used to define the circle. Okay, but we're saying if our event was less than or equal to everything on the inside of the circle, then our complementary event is everything, including the edge of that circle, and then forever. Okay, so that's going to be our complement. Okay, let's just do another example. Um, this is example 11. Okay, so, I'm so sorry, let's put this down into the picture. Bear with me if I get the cameras to function correctly. Um, there. All right, so you've got um, events A1, A2, A3, all the way up to A sub K, and these are intervals of real numbers. And so we're going to define each A1 like this. A1, or A, A sub Y, is between 0 and 1 over I, whatever I happens to be I, this is a lowercase I is one, two, three, 
four, five, six, however high up we're going to go in terms of, we just say K, that's kind of our um, end point. So we want to know what's the union of the mall and what's the intersection of the mall. So it's kind of hard to think of this without actually um, enumerating out some of the first steps. So let's um, enumerate out a little bit. Oops, I spelled that wrong, sorry. I want to be able to visualize this. Enumerating um, can really help you a lot. Okay, so the first thing I'll do is A1. Looks like this. I'm going to go from 0. is less than x, which is less than or equal to 1 over 1. So A1 is between 0 and 1. <clears throat> A2. Um, this is x is between 0 and 1 over 2. Right? Our subscript is our denominator. Right? So we're going to go from 0 to 1 half. So you can see that A2 is actually a part of A1. Right? A1 is the biggest. It's got went from 0 to 1. A2 only goes from 0 to 1 half. Let's just do a couple more. A3 equals from 0 to 1 third. You can see where this is going. Right? So A sub k is going to go from 0 to 1 over k, whatever k is. We haven't specified, so don't sweat it. We're just saying k could be any particular number, right? We're going to start off at 1, and we're going to go up to some number. So when I'm looking at this, right, I can see that my a sub 1 is my biggest set. Biggest. It's got the, you know, the widest range of values, right? So we're going to go from 0 to 1. And they get smaller and smaller and smaller as I go along. So the a sub k, whatever k is, is our smallest our smallest event set, okay? So this one here, our biggest set, actually contains all the other sets, right? You can see that, right? From 0 to 1 half is a part of 0 to 1. 0 to 1 third is a part of even 0 to 1 half, which is a part of 0 to 1, all the way down to 0 to 1 over um, k. Okay, so now that's going to help us be able to think about it, because if I'm looking at, right, a1 union a2, union A3, union all the way up to union A sub K. What do I want the union? All of these, what, what do all of these sets have in common without doing any repeats? Which basically means I'm looking at the union of all the sets, and that union is A1. It's our biggest set. All the other sets are contained within A1. Okay, the next part, part two, this is question one. Question two says, what's the intersection of all Okay, we want to do the intersection of all the sets. Okay, now the intersection of all the sets, which is, what do all of these sets have in common with each other? Okay, what's, what's included in all of them? The only thing that's included in all of them is a sub k. It's our smallest set. Okay, it's the smallest set. So that's the only one, it's like the lowest common denominator here. Okay. <clears throat> We'll come back to example two in just a second. All right, so make sure I've got all these things here. Um, okay, and one last um, definition that I want to throw out to you guys too is an important concept, um, which is called mutual exclusion. Okay, so mutual exclusion, let's do that as a definition here. Okay, so mutual exclusion means that we actually have no outcomes <coughs> in common. <clears throat> so basically, right, I've got these two, I've got A and B are two events in the same sample space, right, but they don't have anything in common, right? So that means that when I take their intersection, there's nothing there. It's the null set. Okay. So then we say if their intersection is the null set, then we're talking about mutually exclusive events. Okay. Great. So let's do this. Um, example 12. If we're going to throw two dice, okay, remember how we threw two dice earlier. Now, event A says we're going to sum up the faces. We want that sum to be equal to an odd number. Okay. So I'm going to take a look at 1 plus 2, right? I've got face 1 is 1, face 2 is 2. I'm going to sum those up. I'm going to get 3. That's an odd number. Okay. 
event B says the event that both die faces are odd. Okay, and one, one, that's event B. Three, three, that's event B. Okay, so I'm gonna be able to use that. So now we wanna take a look at what is the intersection between A and B. All right, so let's take a look first, just a second. So event A, right, is the sum of the faces is an odd number. So I'm gonna say die one plus die two is an odd number. Okay, like we gave the examples, you know, five and three, for example. Okay, B, then um, each face is odd. Is an odd number. Okay, which means that die one is gonna equal to one, three, or five. Die two is gonna equal to one, three, or five. They're both odd numbers, okay? So now I'm taking a look at, is it ever gonna be possible for me to have an intersection which means that I have an odd number that's made up of a sum of two odd numbers. Well, let's think about it. So I'm gonna go odd number plus odd number. Is that gonna give me another odd number? And the answer is no. I can't basically add two odd numbers together and get an, an odd number. I'm gonna get, this is actually equal to an even number. Okay, so there's no way that A and B have anything in common. So the intersection of these two is the null set because it can't possibly happen, okay? There's no overlap in our outcome. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna talk about how we can visualize um, all these different uh, ways of grouping sets together and ways of um, thinking about like unions, intersections, and complements and such. Um, <coughs> we're gonna talk about them. Visualization technique um, that's very common to use is called a Venn diagram. You may have seen these in other classes. Um, I find them very helpful to use, especially when you're trying to think through a complex um, logic arrangement of how we're going to do this stuff. So let's start drawing out what these things can look like. So the first thing we'll do is a complement. Okay, so I've got this box here. The box is going to represent my overall sample space. Okay, and I've got my event A that's being defined within my sample space. Okay, the complement of A is everything outside of my event A. Okay, just to be able to draw it out, okay, my sample space, my event, everything outside of A, right, everything not including A is my complement, A, C. The union, right, we're gonna have two events on this particular case, so I've got my sample space, I've got event A, and I've got event B, okay. Now the union, when we talk about it, A union B, we want to talk about all the things that could happen in A and all the things that could happen in B plus all the things that happen together between those two, okay? Right, but I'm not going to count repeats. Okay, so this is my A union B. So it's everything, basically it's this, this outline right here and everything all included also in the middle here, okay? <clears throat> For intersection, so we're going to draw it out like, so I've got my sample space again. This is my event A, this is my event B, okay? So A is what's defined by this circle right here. B is what's defined by this circle right there. The intersection of where these two events, where these things have stuff in common, is right here in between. There's that little egg shape is right there that I'm trying to do. So say A, intersection B. All the outcomes that are common between both A and B. Okay. This is what mutual exclusion looks like. So if I draw out a sample space and I've got my event A and I've got my event B, and you can see that there's no overlap between them, right? So I've got all of A here, I've got all of B here, there's nothing that's shared between them. So we would say their intersection is the null set. And that's how we define that something is mutually exclusive. Okay, there's just nothing shared between those two. <clears throat> okay, so some of the common things that um, that happen in the problems that we're going to be working on, one of the things that happens is we're asked to find out, which this is on the screen, a situation where we have either A or B, but not both. So this is our goal, this is where we're headed towards. So I'm gonna use the Venn diagrams to help me figure that out. So the event is gonna be described like this. 
So here's my simple space. Here's event A. Here's event B. Okay. So when both occur, that's this stuff right in the middle, right? That's our intersection. Okay. But in this case, I want to have A alone, which is this bit right here. I'm going to try to shade this in nicely here. Or I'm going to have B alone, which is this bit right here. But not both, not these two right there in the center. Okay. So what do I need to do? I need to think about how I'm going to break this apart into different pieces. Okay. So the first piece I'm going to think about is I'm going to take a look at A intersection with B complement. Okay. What does that look like? The intersection with B complement is going to look like this. So first let's draw out here's A and here's B. Okay. So <clears throat> A is this whole circle right there. B is this whole circle right here. If this is B, right, B complement is everything outside of B, which also includes parts of A, right? So if I want to find what's in common between A and everything outside of B, I'm just looking at this little sliver, this little piece right here. Okay, so it's basically just A, A alone. It looks, I'm going to draw it out of context like this. Okay, that gives me this bit. Okay. Now I need to do this again for B. So I'm going to take a look at, I'm going to say B intersection with A complement. We're going to see what that looks like. So here's our nickel space. Here's A. Here's B. Okay. Now again, A complement. So here's A. Okay. A complement is everything outside of A, including all this stuff in B. Okay. Where B overlaps with A complement is this bit right here. So this is another way of saying just B alone, but no A, right? So if they overlap, then I'm excluding that. And it looks like, oops, like that. I didn't draw that very well. Okay, just B alone. Okay, so this is all the stuff um, that's just basically overlapping between B and A complement. Okay, so now this is a way I'm going to put these two together, right? Because you can see this on our original picture here, right? So what I want, this is either A or either B, but not both. And I'm not looking for the complement either because I want one or the other. Okay, so I need to put these two together, which means I'm going to use this bit and this bit, right? I'm going to take both of them. So what I'm going to say, Either A or B alone, but not both is going to be <clears throat> A intersection B complement union with B intersection A complement. And that is how I'm going to get this drawing right there, which gives us either A or B, but not both. Okay. <clears throat> Another possibility for things that you might be asked to do is we want to look at at most. You have to watch out for the wording because at most is different than at least. Okay, so watch the wording on this stuff. At most, one of the two events, A or B, occurs. So at most means I have A or I have B or maybe I don't have anything happening, right? It's at most one of the two events is going to occur. Okay, so. <clears throat> I'm going to take a look at um, in terms of complements, right? But first thing I want to think about what happens when A and B both occur. That looks like this. A and B both occurring. So here's my simple space. Here's A. Here's B. A and B both occurring, occurring is this little sliver right here in between these two. Okay, so A and B both occur right there. So what I need is this is our A intersection of B. In order to get at most one of these things happening, including all the stuff outside of it in our whole sample space, I need to take the complement of this. Right, so I'm going to get, it's going to be A, intersection of B, I'm going to take the complement of the whole thing, like that. And what that's going to look like is like this. Let me draw this out. Here's A, here's B, right? I want everything. I want all of A. This is either A or B, but not both, because I'm excluding the middle. But I also want to leave open the possibility that nothing happens, okay, which is all the rest of the space here. Okay, this is A complement and B complement together. Okay. 
<clears throat> All right, this got outcome in which nothing happens. Okay, so that's something to think about. Make sure you're reading the words very carefully, right? Because at most, it's going to be different than at least. Okay, so at most, one of the two events, drawing out the Venn diagrams is going to help you visualize what you're looking at. Okay, and that's the end of chapter 2.2.